the RRR cycle, which is reduce, reuse, and recycle. This we call the waste hierarchy. We start with reduction, then we do reusing, and the third one is the recycling. For an example, reinforcement steel we use in construction, where we start reducing first we should procure the exact quantity so that our wastage and scrap will be minimum so wastage will be minimum means we don't have reuse or recycle comes in our subject in stage two when we have some scrap or waste left with us we can use it for some works like driveway projections themes which is not a major structural component. Then after reusing, if we have some more quantity of materials left with us, we can go for recycling, where we can send it to the rolling mills for re-rolling, and after that again, we will get the steel back to our construction. So this way we can reduce the wastage and we can use the scrap materials into our field. Next, <clears throat> uh, one second, Mr. Arindam. Just I'll ask the people uh, is it audible, sir? I'll ask there is a participant. There's a point in the chat box saying that it's not audible. Is it audible for the participants? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Now, what is the significance yeah, of the research? Uh, I've no WhatsApp What's that? I'm sorry for the, the issue. You can just uh, re unmute your mic once again. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, what is the process and significance of recycling? It comes in this third stage. Third stage of this waste hierarchy. So recycling comes in the third stage and aims at environmental sustainability by substituting raw material inputs into and redirecting waste outputs out of the economic system. Recyclable materials generally include glass, paper, cardboard, metal, plastic, tires, textiles, batteries, and electronics. On the other hand, the biodegradable waste like food or garden waste, etc., also been recycled through composting and other processes. When it comes to recycle, along with helping in reducing the waste burden of the planet, the recycle industry saves over 700 million tons of CO2 emissions every year, which is very important for us particularly nowadays when we are talking about the global warming. This is a very critical point where we can save 700 million tons of CO2 emissions every year. Now, there are specific ISO standards related to various recycling processes, which are 15270 2008 for the plastics and 14001 2015 or environmental management control of recycling practice. Next slide, please. Now about the recycling, if we come to our country, in India, annually we have a waste of about 62 million tons. This is the total annual waste, out of which we can collect 43 million tons which is about 70% of the total waste. We have 19 million tons of uncollected waste, which is 30% of the annual waste we could not collect. Now, out of the collected waste, again, we can treat 11.9 million tons, that is 27%. And we use for landfill the balanced part of the waste, which is about 31 million tons. That is 73%. So if you consider about the total annual waste, we can treat only 20% of the annual waste. 
So 80% of the annual waste we cannot treat. So recycling is applicable to 20% of the annual waste only. Now, if we reduce, that is the first stage, we reduce the annual waste. This is the first step we can control. The second, if we reuse it, again, we don't come to the treatment process. And after that, ultimately, we are coming to the recycle part. So we have to work on the balance 80% of the annual waste by reusing or reducing. Now, if we come about the Global Recycling Day, what is the significance of Global Recycling Day? Today, it is well understood that waste reduction is an important tool for environmental sustainability through reducing the exploration and deformation of the natural resources to keep our living comforts unchanged. The last decade has been the hottest on record. We now face a climate emergency of unparalleled proportions. If we don't work together to make significant and rapid changes, we will see continued rising global temperatures, melting ice caps, continents on fire and rapid deforestation. Now more than ever, we all need to do our part in contributing towards a greener future. This is the call of the day. To promote this message and keep the global population aware on this subject, aiming at practicing and making a habit in their lives, the Bureau of International Recycling, that is the Global Federation of the Recycling Industry, they took an initiative of showcasing its benefits to the industry, the policymakers, and all the various communities. On the occasion of the 70th anniversary of BIR, that was on March 18, 2018, the Federation launched this Global Recycling Day with a particular theme for each year's celebration. This year, the theme of Global Recycling Day is Recycling Heroes. It would recognize the people, places, and activities that showcase how the seventh resource and recycling contribute to an environmentally stable planet and a greener future for all. They have selected Greta Thunberg and Leonardo Wilhelm DiCaprio. Now, Greta Thunberg is a 17 years old Swedish environmental activist, the daughter of an opera singer, Melina Iman, an actor. Shantanba. Greta first heard about climate change in 2011 when she was eight years old and realizing the phenomena, what she did has taken her to the nomination for Nobel Peace Prize for a consecutive two years, that is 2019 and 2020 game. On the other hand, Leonardo DiCaprio is a popular American actor and producer, who has become famous for his play in the film Titanic. So his choice Hello? Sorry guys. Participants, please mute your mics. This is again very irritating. Please put sure. your mics on mute. Yeah. Accept the presenter. Please put your mics on mute. Sorry, Mr. Arindam. Please go ahead. Yeah. So, the 46 years old American actor and producer who is famous for the last film Titanic, he's an environmentalist as well. His career choice as a child was to become a marine biologist. But eventually, the second choice was actor and he became the latter. DiCaprio not only owns environment-friendly electric hybrid vehicles and his home is powered by solar panels, he also contributes to the mission whenever he finds any opportunity. Now, with this theme that is on the Recycling Heroes 
and propagating the message from the global recycling agencies. We hope to find new heroes among you who will exert sincere efforts to make the difference towards a more sustainable environment through your sincere practice in your daily life. Now, come to my subject that is water resource and management. The first ever Global Recycling Day, which was in 2018, it has encouraged people to unite across the world to realize the need to conserve our six primary resources, that is water, air, coal, oil, natural gas, and minerals, and introduce the term seventh resource, that is, the goods we recycle every day. Generally, we focus on plastics in a more in a major way, but it actually includes all the other items. But I will restrict my discussion today with water only, which is the most important natural resource on earth. Now, if I consider water as a source. Uh, next slide, please. If I consider water as a resource, the earth is covered three-fold by water and one-fold by land. But this total three-fourth of water, which is in volume terms about 1386 billion cubic kilometer or 330 million cubic miles, it has only 97.5% salt water, and we are left with 2.5% as fresh water. Now, out of that fresh water of 2.5%, 68.7% is trapped into glaciers, and we are left with only 0.3%, which is in the liquid form on the surface. Again, on that part, only about 1.2% can be used as drinking water. That is 0.001247 cubic kilometers, or 0.00009% of the total volume of water. The rest is locked into glaciers, ice caps, permafrost, or buried deep into the ground. So most of our drinking water comes from rivers and streams, which are really, really very nominal in the volume that we see. Now, if you think about the source of water and usage of water, now this minimum water that we get, we get through surface water, groundwater, and auxiliary water. Surface water we get from streams, rivers, torrents, tanks, streams, lakes, and reservoirs. In the ground, we get it through open wells, steep wells, artesian wells, population tanks, and auxiliary water. It is through tailrests, drainage outfall, flood absorbing reservoirs, colliery, and industrial effluent, and sewage discharge. On the other hand, if you think about our usage of water, it has again three consumptive, partial consumptive, and non consumptive. Consumptive is in irrigation, which consumes the maximum quantity of water. On public, a partial consumptive, we have the public water supply, fire demand, industrial use, power generation. And non consumptive sector is hydropower inland navigation, pollution control, and recreation, and aquaculture. Now, we need to adopt suitable water management system to tap the water from its sources scientifically without creating any damage to the environment, distribute it to the user's point economically, use the water properly, and prevent wastage of this valuable resource 
and allow recycling process to feed to the system again. Non-scientific exploration, obstruction, or ill routing of its natural flow, artificial rain, or infusion of pollutants, contaminants in its source or in the environment shall affect the sustainability of the environment and even our existence. The ill effects could be irregular monsoon, hydrological imbalance, irregular soil movement, erosions, earthquake, volcanic eruptions, depletion of vegetation and global warming, and so on. We should care in conservation of water, adopting suitable techniques of recycling and replenishment of the resource through rainwater harvesting, groundwater recharging processes. Now look into some facts to explain why we are concerned about conservation of water. By 2025, water withdrawals are predicted to increase by 50% in developing countries and 18% in developed countries. By 2025, half the world's people will live in countries with high water stress. Two-thirds of the world's population is projected to face water scarcity in 2025. The standard norm for the India is one thirty capital as described by CPHEO. Every Indian wastes up to five liters of water per day. Now, other facts of conservation of water going unknowing we waste water every uh, next. Teeth, for few examples of wasting water on daily basis. We use about 27% of water for bathing and toilet use, out of which approximately 4,000 drops of water, equivalent to a liter of water, can be wasted due to a leaking faucet. Now, it is to be noted that approximately 163 million Indians don't have access to clean drinking water. Unfortunately, more than half the rivers are polluted and considered unsafe by modern standards. The main water bodies of Ganga, Jamuna, and Savarmati have a deadly mix of pollutants, which are both organic and hazardous. It is shocking to hear that Kolkata wastes 50% of the water that it receives, followed by Bangalore, which is the third most populous city in the country, comes a close second at 49%. Water wastage figures in New Delhi, Chennai, and Mumbai stands at 26%, 20%, and 18% respectively. Now, how much rainwater is busted in India? It has been estimated that over a developed area, we can get out 65% of the runoff from the hard area, including roads.
Excuse me. Please put uh, switch up your mics. Please switch up your mics. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. And the water wastage figures in New Delhi. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> so now, for a safe design, we consider an average of seventy percent yield for harvesting over any built-up area. For majorly green areas, an yield of twenty-five percent has been considered after accounting for evaporation, groundwater, population, etc. Now, study on New Delhi in the year 2010 has revealed that we could have harvested almost 470 billion liters of water out of 681 mm of rainfall recorded. So that signifies the importance of rainwater harvesting, which we can recycle in our water consumption cycle. Now we take a reference of a city, Kolkata. The core Kolkata city is spread over around 200 square kilometers. And it has a population of four and a half million people. The greater urban conglomeration includes 41 other cities and hosts nearly 15 million, making it the third largest city in the country. It has also been one of the most water rich cities of India. River Ganga is flowing beside its western end, traditionally, huge groundwater reserve and wide wetland areas in its eastern fringe, which naturally treats its wastewater and turns that as raw water for fishery and agriculture. Officially, 15% of core Kolkata's water come from groundwater sources and raised from surface water with the entire city. But in reality, up to 25 to 30% of the water used in households is groundwater. It has been found that despite having water connections, People prefer to use groundwater than the water supplied by civic bodies due to taste and age old practice. Even the multi storied buildings and sprawling urbanization throughout the outskirts of the city withdraws groundwater unofficially, which endangers the groundwater level and quality of water, leading to contamination with arsenic or salinity incursion. Now, according to School of Environmental Studies of Jadavpur University, nearly 55% of the city's groundwater has high levels of arsenic compared to the World Health Organization standard. Kolkata officially has about 17,000 stand posts as water hydrants, as referred to in the city, 12,000 hand tube wells, and around 2,500 large tube wells mainly catering to multi-story buildings, but the actual figures are far higher. This groundwater exploration is a serious problem for a city like Calcutta. It, it will create the soil instabilization, instabilization as well. Now, more than 315 million gallons of drinking water is withdrawn daily from the Thames area with a per capita consumption of nearly 200 liters per day. Nearly 35% of the city population lives in slum, who have limited access to public sources and very rare access to private ones. They generally receive drinking water only through a few stand posts. The city dwellers do not have to shell out any water tax to corporation as declared mandate. In 2011, the CM has abolished the collection of water tax 
which deterred the revenue to the municipal authorities. And hence the cost of producing drinking water got increased, which could make the system maybe unstable in the long run. According to Professor Pradeep Siddhar of IISWBM in Kolkata, the city's groundwater demand may rise to about 25% by 2025 from the present demand of around 310 million liters per day. Based on this seriousness of availability of water as a resource, now I will present a case study on a live project. On this project, I got the opportunity to work with. This is about construction of an upscale holiday facility in Sundarbans, West Bengal. <clears throat> a suitable land parcel of about eight acres had been purchased and relevant design were made to accommodate about 85 tourists in 22 building units providing state-of-the-art comfort and facilities. But it has been observed that the area does neither have any suitable source to supply adequate potable water, nor does it have a drainage system to discharge the waste and wastewater from this resource. It was a challenge to us as the management consultant to identify suitable source feed it to the original project concept and suggest right path of implementation using available resources and construction practices as an economic solution. For your reference, Sundarban is a designated UNESCO World Heritage Site. So polluting the environment and disturbing the national atmosphere by any means are not only objectionable but punishable. It does not have any suitable aquifer at a shallow depth, and boring for a suitable aquifer is highly expensive and uncertain. Even treatment of the available saline water is also uneconomic. So, based on this background, we have thought of a zero discharge concept for this project. We have worked out a rainwater harvesting plan as a source of water, planned a sewage treatment plant on biodegradable system to treat the waste and wastewater out of this project, and designed a suitable distributory system to use the treated water for various usage within the resort here itself. The entire management scheme had been worked out very economic cost-effective, user-friendly, maintenance-friendly, and most importantly, environment-friendly. Now, presently, the standards of hotels and lodges in Sundarbans are not suitable to accommodate global tourists or high-end travelers. So it is almost a virgin area to establish tourism in an organized format on a large scale. This land parcel is located at Dulki, which is on Gosaba Island, just opposite to Pakhiral, which is the gateway of Sundarban's wildlife sanctuary. The location is ideal to augur tourism potential and attract tourists from all over the countries to enjoy the wildlife, bird watching, tiger trails, and natural beauty of the forest. The tourists could stay in this resort and collect the necessary permissions to visit Sundarban's wildlife sanctuary from the forest department at Pakhirala, at least to trail through Sajnekali, Sudhanekali, Dobati, Meti Bhutani, Buridabri, Talasdi, and other tiger manifested areas by cruising through the rivers and creeks in the permissible zones in the daytime, and could come back to the resort at the dusk for a comfortable stay to start the next day of expedition with a better spirit. Now I show you the description of the project. This is the master plan of the project, which includes the reception block, staff quarters, driver rooms, water side restaurant, a cafe, 
So all the amenities and facilities which are spread all over the area of eight acres. <clears throat> now, the technical design and drawings related to architecture and landscape of the proposed resort are made to build a state of art resort, which can satisfy the global tourists by providing all required facilities and amenities for a safe and comfortable visit. The large area has been kept as open to sky in the form of sprawling landscape garden, which is 38% of the entire area. Water bodies, 23% of the area. Pathways, 16%. Circulation areas, 8%, which will provide the feel of openness as a part of the original environment of the forest area. Only 15% of the area has been used to allocate 22 residential cottage units to accommodate about 85 tourists with service block, staff quarter, kitchen, dining facilities, and other amenities. Now, implementation of a project in Sundarban is very difficult. We have to face a lot of challenges. The key challenges are access to the area, communication system, commuting facilities, natural calamities, resource availability, local infrastructure in the form of physical and civic infrastructure, economy of the area, social structure of the area, political restrictions, to name some few. Overcoming these challenges, is really a difficult task for implementation of any project in the area. The project location being in an island does not have any direct road connectivity with the main road. From Gosaba, a traveler has to travel by boat to cross the river Birdadhari to reach the other bank at Godkhal. All the materials and passengers need to travel and carry up to the resort by road and waterways by the present system. All the construction materials, equipment, laborers need to be transported through the waterways, which is time consuming, labor intensive, and expensive affairs. Moreover, most important is commuting through the waterways always full of uncertainty. The regular tidal conditions, wind, and storm effects. In monsoon, the uncertainty is more severe. Emergency arrangements for man and machine have to be maintained at the project site to prevent disruption in work. The other challenge which we have faced in implementation of this project was water management system. The idea does neither have adequate supply of sweet water nor it has proper drainage system. The area does not have any suitable aquifer within a depth of about 350 meters from the existing ground level. The local people majorly depend on rainwater, which is stored in shallow water bodies and ponds, as found in abundance all over the islands for their regular usage throughout the year, which is very, very unhygienic. They do all their regular activities with this stored water only, the stagnant stored water. The local people continuously attempt to explore boring in search of water at different levels at shallow depths as per their budget and requirement in agriculture and other activities, which in turn depletes the aquifer reserve faster and faster and hence affects the natural process of filtration, which causes contamination and salination of underground water severely. Salinity is a curse to the area, which causes soil erosion, reduces fertility of the soil, dipping groundwater level, which results in no agriculture, lesser farming, poor health of the people, and starving economy. Water from mainland is transported to these islands by ferry service in containers. Packaged water is sold through shops and distributors. Tourists use the packaged water 
But disposal of the plastic containers are again an environmental challenge. Farming and cultivation are completely being dependent on the rainwater, and hence the agricultural activities are very limited and restricted for quantum, variety, and quality of the crops and yield. There are no proper drainage or sewerage treatment facilities available in this area. Once our project gets operational, it will discharge various organic and inorganic wastes which need proper system to obey the ethical and statutory guidelines for maintaining environmental statute. The key problems are thus identified where non-availability of potable water and absence of suitable sewerage system. The solution suggested was to introduce the zero discharge system by adopting rainwater harvesting arrangement and implementation of sewage treatment facility with biodegradable technology. The implementation of the same shall additionally benefit in providing strengthening solution to the local soil profile. The solid waste after treatment in bioread system produces manures in liquid form, which in turn help, in turn help in reducing salinity of the soil and increasing fertility, which helps in better plantation and preservation of the natural forestry and prevent the soil erosion. Now, what is zero discharge concept? So this is a zero discharge concept cycle where we have the demand, discharge, facilities and supply all in a loop. So all our discharges from toilets, kitchen, rainwater, laundry, spa, etc. collected and transported to the treatment facility. Now the treatment plant, horticulture, water bodies and fountains are being fed from the, by the water from this treatment plant. And on the supply side, we have packaged water, municipal supply, bore well, rainwater harvesting, monsoonal reserve, treated water. And on the demand side, that is our consumption, we have drinking, cooking, washing, utensils, bathing, washing clothes, cleaning houses, flushing, and irrigation. So if we meet our demand through our available resources with proper treatment, and proper distributing system, then we can completely install a zero discharge system. This is the demand and availability of water resource in our project. We have found that in winter, the occupancy rate is highest and hence the highest demand of water, which we could serve to our adequate storage of monsoon reserve. And on the other hand, in summer, though the storage capacity is low, the occupancy rate is least. So our occupancy level, as well as consumption level, has been rightly matched with our storage capacity or availability of water. So this seasonal demand, has perfectly fit to our harvested water resource. Now, this is a network diagram, a PI diagram, to represent how we have planned the water management system in our project. We have the wastewater line, the flush water line, and fresh water line. We have different water bodies as shown in the diagram in blue. So in those water bodies, we collect the rainwater, the monsoonal rainfall, and that rainfall is stored within these water bodies in different sections. And we tap those water, pump it to our treatment plant as shown on the back side of the uh, land area. The water after treatment distributed to various units of cottages, 
restaurants, kitchens. And after consumption, the wastewater, those are again collected at the STP, located at the opposite side. And after treatment from the STP, the water again comes back to a water body in a recycling process. The rainwater, now all the stages are being narrated here. So stage one, in the stage one, the rainwater being the purest form of water is collected in various water bodies within the project area during monsoon. The roof drainage being the purest source is collected in separate storage, followed by the surface runoff in another separate storage. The roof drainage is in more pure state and needs lesser treatment for human consumption, while in surface drainage there is possibility of contamination and mixing of unwanted and undesirable materials, which needs further screening and treatment, and hence collected in different water bodies. This separate collection and treatment processes bring economy and effective usage to the system. In stage two, the water from specific pond shall be pumped to the water treatment plant for necessary treatments after due screening at different screening chambers as per the raw water quality. Then the water is supplied to the cottages by hydropneumatic system for usage in toilets. The water for direct human consumption in drinking, preparation of food, and washing utensils undergo a further treatment through reverse osmosis plant and supplied through different pipeline to the user's tap. The water to replenish the swimming pool and for usage in laundries for washing clothes are treated through softener units and supplied through another channel accordingly. In stage three, the waste water from kitchen, laundry, spa, and swimming pool, and waste from toilets are collected in separate channels to convey to the sewage treatment plant after tapping the suspended solids, grease, soap, alkali, and other chemicals. The sewage treatment plant is based on bio read technology, which decomposes, digests, and treats the solid and liquid wastes in an organic biodegradable technology to discharge the treated water through sand, bed filter in a reusable form. In stage four, the discharge in the form of treated water from the bio -read tank is collected in a separate and dedicated large water body for its major use in irrigation for the large landscape area in horticulture and fountains. The decomposed and digested night soil in the liquid form serves as manure for growing plantations through reed-based technology. So there is no need for handling or disposal of any material from the site. Rather, the waste materials are duly treated for their specific usage within the campus and keep the environment pollution free. A diagrammatic presentation explains it better. Now the inferences. The complete water management system following the zero discharge concept using rainwater harvesting method and bio -read technology proved to be most appropriate method. The complete cycle of operation involving rainwater harvesting in right quantities, creating adequate areas for collection and storage differently up on the quality of water collected, different distribution channels leading to the treatment facility for different parameters and supply to the user's staff with infusion of suitable ingredients as and when required and arrangement of appropriate discharge channels in totality has brought an economic, organic, sustainable, and efficient system, which is absolutely environment-friendly.
Similarly, the installation of bioread system help in collection of the solid and liquid waste within a smaller area, mostly it is underground. Treatment by organic process using majorly microbes and reed-based aquatic plants. Reuse the organic materials for plantation and salinity prevention has brought an economic, organic, sustainable and efficient system which is again environment friendly. The system does not discharge any inorganic and toxic elements Rather, most of the treated materials in the form of water, manure, and biogas are consumed within the project and hence help in achieving a zero discharge status. The advantages of bioread system conventional STD. The complete design of the system is more simplistic and easy to work based on biodigester technology. It is a method of treating sewage utilizing natural vegetation and rhizosphere microorganisms. Instant is much less than the conventional system. Maintenance activities are minimum and hence of negligible cost as compared to the conventional system, which has further running cost involvement for manpower and electricity. Smaller space is required and mostly it is underground to install and operate. More hygienic system as it kills all the pathogens within the digester itself and prevents spreading of waterborne diseases by effluent sewage. It is applicable to all type of terrains. It produces large quantity of biogas and potable water as byproducts for further usage. It does not require any electricity. It does not affect the aesthetics of the environment, rather improves the aesthetics and atmosphere by addition of plants, flora and water in various ways and controlling the temperature and humidity. No mosquitoes and odor nuisance. The treated water can be used for enhancement of environmental architecture, such as roadside fountains or in irrigation for landscape plantation. Now, conclusion, whatever source of water we find on earth is not meant for us. It is meant for some other purposes, for some other species, plants and animals. It is to maintain the geophysical composition, balance of water cycle, stability of the ground structure, sustainability of the earth. We could not directly consume it. It would require suitable treatments and care to be taken in protecting incursion of pollutants, contaminants, and replenishment adequate volume to maintain the geophysical formation, prevent the climatic change, growth of vegetation of plants, and global warming. So, it is really a good thing our existence as a whole. So, it is advisable to restrict our intake within our permissible limits only as an economic and sustainable solution. If we want to tap more resources, we shall make our environmental stability at stake. So it is better to use the available resource by reducing wastage, reuse as and when applicable, and recycle it as much as possible to replenish the storage. So this three R of recycling has been well explained through our water recycling process in this Sundarban project. So on the eve of this World Recycling Day, we shall take oath of sensible usage of water in our daily life towards creating a more sustainable world for our future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Mukhopadhyay. <clears throat> now we've got some questions. It was really a
very wonderful presentation and i believe this what you have shared is something which is uh, uh need of now, not just now but for a long time and this is a situation we are uh, well aware with and this is a situation which we are facing day in and day out and this is something which is often brushed under the carpet because water wastage because is such a concern area and we as a country in india are blessed with so much water we do not understand the you know, effect of water wastages so we got some questions in the chat box i request you to unmute your mic mr mukhopadhyay because i had to do so for some yes. background noises so i'll just go with the questions uh, just a second just let me organize the things once by one okay so there's a question from mr rishiraj dhar uh, the question is regarding desalination mr bhagwatwe yes uh, just a second the question is desalination desalination is is quickly becoming a popular technique for obtaining potable water in your opinion now there are two questions on this in your opinion are membrane processes more feasible or thermal processes this question number 1 so would you answer the question now or i'll share the both the questions yeah firstly desalination is a very expensive treatment process so that is why desalination is not being a preferred process of water treatment and for the second question that is membrane technology is more acceptable nowadays because of its more advanced or uh, advantages and slowly it will get less expensive as well okay so uh the next uh, second question of the same uh, participant is how can we deal with the excessive brine production i think you replied already that this illness is not very feasible so yes uh let me go ahead with the next questions uh sir if the rain water now there is a question from uh, ms koshani sarkar sir if the rain water is acidic then is it okay to run it with minimum filtration yeah the treatment we can do organic and inorganic as well so acidic in nature of rain water definitely can be treated in organic manner as well so with minimum filtration what you said right yes okay. yes now there is one more question from mr bikash krishna bera is the question is what happens in case of insufficient rain water or scarcity situation yes so for rain water uh, if we don't have adequate rain water definitely we have to think for the alternative and for this project we have a shallow depth uh, bore well available with us but uh, so far as per the rain data and uh, the current condition we don't envisage any uh, shortfall for uh, rain water and the amount of rain water we require for our project we are quite uh, satisfied with the data we have so we can get adequate rain water with us but we have a alternative source as well for in future if anything happens we can definitely go for treatment of the bore well uh, water and we can use it okay there's one question from again from ms koshani just i think this pertains to your project uh, to pertains to your presentation and the project which you are doing at sundarbans will the stored water be sufficient in non rainy season yes because the graph that i have shown mm. we have estimated the amount of our demand and the quantum of source we have see we have not only the monsoonal rain we have some rains within the year also so we have estimated those uh, rains as a replenishment of the available storage and what we have calculated that entire consumption can be met with the available uh, 
water that we have. Only with the rainwater we can do it. Because 38% of the entire area and 23% of the available uh, water bodies. So we have designed all those water bodies with a depth, with a profile of the uh, storage sections in such a way that it can store the adequate water for our uh, demand. Okay. There's one question uh, regarding from Mr. Somitra Sural. He is asking regarding the borid system for STP plant. If you could share something Pardon? on that. Pardon? Borid system. Bio, sorry, biorid system. I'm sorry, I haven't read it. Biorid yeah. system for STP bio plant. Biorid system is a proven uh, technology. It is in function in many other countries. Particularly, we have found it in Israel in a very wide scale. In India also, we use it in many projects. Uh, Biorid is based on a reed-based technology, where entire waste, solid and liquid waste, are being collected at the first chamber, which is known as biodigester, where the solid waste get digested, composed, and after that, in liquid form, it comes to the other tank, where it is called the bio reed tank, where we have the reed based plants that yeah. is on the top. So this liquid waste, yeah. it serves as a manure to the plant to grow and the clean water through this treatment plant comes out for reuse in other uh, usages. Okay. So, so this is absolutely an organic method of treatment process where we don't need any uh, equipment further, no maintenance is very less, and we don't need any electricity as well. So it's a natural flow with a natural uh, system. It uh, entirely treats the system. So there is quite, there's a, uh, addition to that question by another participant, Mr. Anirban. So what is the minimum cap of the wired system and is it economical or expensive over the conventional system? The two questions, minimum cap of bio system Correct. and is it economical Correct. or expensive over a convention? Uh, see, in uh, in this project, we are putting up a 45 KLD of uh, uh, bio system. And uh, it can start with five, five is also okay. And up to 250, 240 also, we have the experience in uh, putting up the plant in India itself. So this is a range of from 5 to 250 KLD. And what about the commercial? And the second part, question is about the uh, uh, cost part, right? Yeah. yeah. This is uh, absolutely economic than the conventional system. Firstly, your uh, initial expenses and secondly the maintenance charge. Initial expense, if you consider, it is about uh, about 10% uh, to 15% less than the conventional system. And maintenance part, it is uh, very very minimal. For example, if you uh, for our project, if the maintenance for conventional system is uh, rupees 3000 for any unit. So it comes to about 450 for this system. So compared to that range, if you go with that, it's about six times. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bukhavad, can I have, uh, share your email ID with the participants for maybe questions later? Yeah, yeah, sure. Could you just uh, share your email ID so that I can write it down in the chat box? Yeah. A R I N. Yeah. D A M okay. dot yeah. S O L I S O L I T A I R D -E. T A I R E solitaire okay solitaire at the rate mm -hmm. gmail dot com okay okay and uh, is it possible to share your presentation with the participants if they require or something is uh, can be a Confidential, in fact. Uh, 
I have already presented this paper to different uh, forums. Okay. So I made this presentation specifically for your requirement. Okay. And if the participants they want the uh, a copy of the presentation, that you can share with. Sure. Okay. So I'll go with the questions again. Uh, there's a question uh, from Mr. Anirban, who's the supplier of Bayrid system. I'm not going to that question. I would request you not to reply on this question with the supplier because it's a technical paper. We do not want to come out with names of uh, suppliers and vendors. So that mm. if they require, they can get in touch with you on the mail. And uh, what are the different Correct. next questions from Mr. Udesh Roy? What are the different types of testing for measuring the wastewater? See, for wastewater, we have first the assessment, organic and inorganic, what the materials are there, what are the components are there. And based on that, we have separate systems. For example, I have given this uh, narration in our project that we have separate storage tanks for different water. One is from roof water, one is the surface runoff. So all these water, they have different type of pollutants or contaminants with it. So their purity differs. So based on that purity, we have different type of treatments as well. Because for a pure water, we need not go for much treatment. Rather, for a uh, impure water, we need more treatments. So that will economize my treatment cost and treatment processes as well. And accordingly, we get the ultimate uh, desired result or desired uh, water quality, which we distribute to our entire uh, project. Okay. Uh, there's one more question from Mr. Pankaj Gupta. He wants to know how much government has subsidized uh, on the installation of rainwater harvesting in a residential project. Some percentage numbers. Uh, commercial, terms, commercial terms, I cannot uh, tell you instantly because I do not look at it uh, in depth because I have other people looking after the commercial parts. Got it. Got it. So, I'm okay. concerned about the technical parameters only. Right, right. So that answers Ms. Koshani Sarkar's question also that we cannot share the cost analysis yet. It is only the technical front of it, as well as we would not like, no, would not, we would not like to share any vendor names also. So yeah, cost analysis of the project I I can do, but I will not uh, instantly uh, tell it to you. Yeah, uh, because this is not the right forum to discuss on it. Correct. So in future, if required, we can discuss on the cost part of, of the components of the technology. Right. But what the other one uh, I told about the commercial means the taxes, the subsidies or the government benefits. Mm -hmm. Those things I'm not very much uh, aware of because the other people are there who do some. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arindam. Uh, we don't have any other questions from your uh, from the chat box. So I believe all right. the questions have been answered. So uh, if anybody wants to get in touch or they come up with questions, your email ID is already in the chat box. They would surely get in touch with you. And I'm sure you would be pleased to reply to them. Right? Sure. Thank sure. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your Thank presence. You. And it's a pleasure. Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Right. With this, I end the meeting.